but I think um, I think we can get started. Welcome to the Red Geographics Fairground. We are very excited to have you here, and I hope you're excited too. My name is Madame T. I don't know who that is. Um, I have looked into my crystal ball, so I can tell you all about our program for today. But before you can enjoy this fun fair and see all of our marvels and wonders, we'd like to introduce you to the Red Geographics and the people behind it. Behind it. Before I let our presenters present, I will present our presenters to you first. After that, Hans will take over the stage and tell you everything about bus routes maps. And our final act will be presented by Patrick Koning. He is going to show you how you can use FME to facilitate continuous improvement of your application. Don't forget, tomorrow we will be live with part two, where we feature the Transformer Freak Show, the workspace design and best practices carousel, and we talk about automating as built acquisition for a grid operator in the Netherlands, which is presented by no other than Tom van der Putte from the People Group. But let's start by introducing Red Geographics. We started in 2004 and quickly became a well known and well-liked FME partner in the Dutch market and beyond. We have customers on every continent except Antarctica. I already showed you the three people behind it, so let's get to know Hans a little bit better. Ringmaster Hans has been working with FME for more than 24 years and is one of the community champions on Safe user platform. He still remembers the good old days where you could simply email Don or Dale with support questions. But do you have an FME question? Hans can answer them all. Our acrobat Fiele juggles a life of biking with marketeering our circus and keeping everyone happy. And our lion tamer Inge is in the process of becoming an FME certified professional and is already an assistant FME trainer. Now we want to know you. Personal contact is one of our main values and we are pretty proud of our short and fast communication. We also love collaborations with other enthusiastic organizations with the same value to help our customers in the best way we can. If you come to us with a problem, we'll do our best to help you. But if we can solve your problem, we get in contact with people who can. That gives us the freedom to do what we can do best and give you our high quality service you deserve. And another thing we do is share knowledge. For example, on the FMA user community where Hans is very active, but also by giving training on different levels. Shoot us a message if you want to learn more about the options, because we have got some great online events planned. Aside from being a partner of Safe Software and delivering services such as training and consultancy, we represent another Canadian company, that's Avenza Systems, and we represent, we represent them in the same way. They're developing cartographic plugins for the Adobe Suite, and a lot of the projects we do are focused on the border between GIS and cartography. This often involves using FME to process data from GIS into a beautiful map. Next up is presenting our presenters. First up is our very own ringmaster of Red Geographics, Hans. I just told you a little bit about him, but here's some more info. He has studied cartography and absolutely loves maps. He's worked on big atlases for National Geographic, a number of different globes, many academic publications, and all kinds of maps in between. And he's going to show you a customer story in his presentation today. And he's currently triple certified, so certified professional, certified trainer, and server certified. He has recently won the Data Extraordinaire quiz, and if that doesn't show his level of knowledge, I don't know what does. And if he's not solving customer problems, creating brilliant workspaces or working on beautiful maps, he is probably riding his bike. And if not, he is taking pictures of people riding their bikes. Our second presenter of today is Patrick Koning. He's a designer and developer through and through. Since 2003, he has been involved in the development of user-friendly software applications for GIS related issues. Today, he's involved in developing applications for data conversion and FME plays a prominent role in this. As a professional, he sets high standards for the quality of data. And since 2016, he has been recognized by Safe Software as an FME certified professional. 
and in 2018, he obtained a certification for the Archimed Foundation for its knowledge and skills in the field of software architecture. He likes popcorn, but only eats it after riding the roller coaster. And he will talk about how to get your data you need inside your application. He knows the importance and is not only going to show you the benefits, but also how you could do it and save time and frustration. Then, without further ado, step right up, Ringmaster Hans. Well, thank you for that uh, great introduction, and welcome to my presentation. And I'm going to take you on a roller coaster ride of the project that we've done designing bus route maps for the line. Let's, um, let's see if I get this to work. There we go. It's magic. So, like I said, a roller coaster ride, bus route maps for the line. Um, so, this is me, or rather my alter ego. Um, I usually dress up like this, I, not every time for the photo like that. And let's talk a little bit first about the line. So, the line is the public bus and tram company for Flanders. So that's the northern Dutch speaking part of Belgium. They've got about 2,700 vehicles in use at the moment and over 2019, so pre-COVID, they had 200 million uh, revenue kilometers, I guess you would call them in, in Europe. And so basically it's the public transit for half a country. That's, so it's, it's a pretty big deal. And what, we've, what we're doing for them is we're helping them producing beautiful, really intricate route maps. So coming from a cartography background, um, as Inge mentioned in the introduction, I've made a lot of different maps over the times. Um, but transit networks are some of the hardest things to map. And there's beautiful examples out there. Um, I've, I've shown a few here. There's of course the famous London Underground map uh, based on the designs by Harry Beck. There's the New York City subway map from, I believe, the 1970s or 80s, designed by Massimo, Massimo Vignelli. And they're iconic designs. Everybody who sees that map knows immediately, oh, that's the London Tube map. In fact, the London Tube map is so popular, there's countless of mashups and, and different versions of the London Tube map. Everything nowadays gets mapped as the London Tube map. So transit maps are very hard to do. Um, and especially these ones, because they're not actually geographically correct. Mm -hmm. So getting, um, getting a project to do transit maps was something that made my cartographic heart skip a beat and um, really go for it. But let's talk a little bit first about how we actually got this project. So the, the big start for this project was us realizing that for the Avenza software, where we're the only partner within the Benelux area, or in fact, just one of a handful of partners in Europe, um, we've had a lot of clients in the Netherlands and only a small number, only a handful, like three in Belgium. And so that, that's kind of odd. I mean, Belgium is culturally and economically, it's very similar to the Netherlands. So there's no reason why that shouldn't be um, much more of a user base there. So what we decided to do in 2019 is identify all of our Dutch customers for that product. Then look for comparable Belgian organizations. So we're talking city level government, uh, national governments, anything in between, but also small cartographic firms. So we found a lot of them. We approached all of them and we said, hey, we're doing this free event. It's going to be an afternoon. It's going to be in a central location in Flanders. We're going to do this free event where we're going to talk to you about the, stu the stuff that we can offer. And so I think about 15 potential clients showed up at that meeting. And actually a fair number of them ended up placing orders um, that may actually have something to do with the fact that we filled them up with typical Southern Dutch pastries, Bosse Bollen for our, uh, our Dutch viewers. <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, they slipped into a food coma, so they probably weren't able to say no anyway. <laughs> um, 
But the Lion was one of the organizations that attended that meeting. And in February 2020, they ordered the software. And in June last year, we started the project to develop a new cartographic workflow for them to produce their route maps. Now, whenever it comes to using FME in the cartographic production process, we see there's a fine line between automation and cartographic quality. Of course, coming from a cartographic background, I want to keep the quality as high as possible. Um, we absolutely love automating stuff with FME. That's quite a lot of the projects we do are actually concerning automating cartographic production workflows with it. But there is, um, there is a certain limit to what, F what FME or, or any automated process can do. We want to make sure that we find the right balance between automation and visual quality. We don't want to skim on the visual quality. So our goal is always to automate and save time wherever possible, but let a skilled cartographer focus on the hard bits. And there's a lot of hard bits in these maps. So here's an example of their current map. This is the center of the city of Antwerp. And this has all been done manually. And it's a lot of work. Um, I'd love to work on this, but just to do something like this would, would take days to just do one of their maps. And Antwerp isn't even the, the busiest one, I think. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into this. Um, right at the start, we realized, well, we, we, we can't automate all of this, but we can certainly do our best to try and get as close as possible. So what we decided to do is, first of all, we're using Events as my publisher. That's a plugin for Adobe Illustrator to do cartographic work. You can import GIS data and, uh, and style it. It's, it's kind of like ArcGIS, but within Illustrator. So we use that to automate the production of the base map. So just you know, the city, the roads, the rivers, all of the, the boring topography. Because that's fairly easy. And then the second thing was we developed an FME workspace that takes the, the bus routes and draws them as parallel lines. So you can see, for example, um, the southern of the two crossings of the river has six, is that six? No, a lot of different lines, uh, but they're all drawn parallel to each other to make it easier for somebody to, to follow a line on the map and see where they have to go, where they have to take the bus and get off to get to where they want to go. So we developed an FME workspace that draws those lines in parallel to each other. Those lines are then styled again with my publisher. And then we use the label pro plugin with, within, uh, uh, within my publisher to automate as much of the text placement as possible. And the end result would be a nearly finished map that a skilled cartographer can then apply the finishing touches to. So it's not a, a complete end product yet, but it's something that a cartographer can pick up and start working with. And at least on the first side of the process, save a lot of time. And we've always kept in mind and we've always communicated this with a client. Um, we always say we can't fully automate the whole thing. We'd love to, but we simply can't. And that's what we'll focus on. We try and save time at every junction to every possible place to, uh, to make our lives easier. So how does it work under the hood? So the source data that we get is one line per bus route. We then intersect all of those lines. We identify how many routes share the same road segment. Now, if it's more than 10, their corporate style guide says that we have to use a special line style, which just indicates there's a lot of bus routes running here. If it's less than 10, then we draw them out as parallel lines. Um, just for fun, we ran the whole process on their entire data set for all of Flanders, and that took about 10 minutes. So compare that to how much time it would take for somebody to draw them manually. I think there's a big time saver right there. <laughs> so those parallel lines. Um, 
after identifying how many share the same road segment, we, um, we use an offset curve generator, actually a couple of them, to offset consecutive lines from the original line. So if it's a, an odd number of lines, an odd number of routes sharing the same line, we alternate them between left and right. So we leave the original one on its original location and then left, right, left, right, and so on. If it's an even number, we shift it by half a line width before we do the alternating left, right. Those offset distances, however, we have to calculate them in real world units, but they depend on the line weight, which is given in this case in typographic points on the map. To make it even more complex, their corporate style guide calls for different line weights for different number of parallel lines. So if it's up to five lines, they're being shown as two and a half point wide with a quarter point white gap in between. If it's six lines, it goes down to 2.3. If it's seven lines, it goes down to two and so on. So as the number of lines sharing the same segment grows, their overall width shrinks, which makes it, again, pretty tricky to do all of the math. And that was actually one of the big challenges that I had in doing this project, is, is getting my head around all of the different units. So the, the style guide has the line weights in points. One point is 172nd of an inch. But we have to offset the data in, in, well, in real world units in meters. Um, another thing that's really proving to be very challenging is complex situations. And those would be the situations which you often have in the center of the city where a lot of bus lines converge on, a, on, on one point. Uh, so if there's a lot of different routes sharing one short segment, it kind of goes wonky. In fact, we've decided to simply not show any segments shorter than a certain threshold value and just let the cartographer sort it out because Doing it that way actually saves time over attempting to do it automatically and having them clean it up. Another challenge is that we're currently dealing with the department that used to design the old maps. Um, we're realizing that they don't really have a, a good overview of what's available within the organization as a whole in terms of data. Um, one of the things we ask for, for example, is do you know at which bus stops a bus stops. So if line 100 skips a bus stop somewhere along the route, it, it just passes it by. Is that known somewhere in the data? Because we can, of course, geographically, we can relate them to each other. But, you know, if there's, for example, an express bus line, which skips half of the bus stops, it has to be somewhere in the data. So we're, we've recently gotten access to a new version of the data set, which actually has that information which makes my life in FME a lot easier. But that is one of the challenging things. They never really had to, to worry about that. Um, other things is that, for example, the, the bus route data set that we have contains all of their routes, including, for example, the route that they take from the depot to the place where they start the bus, which is not section that they would pick up passengers along. So it's not something that would be on the passenger facing bus maps. So this is what we currently have in terms of, uh, of line styles. And as you can see, it's not perfect yet, but we're definitely getting somewhere. Um, fortunately, all of the colors are encoded in the data as color names. So we can simply style them with um, predefined styles within uh, my publisher. And as you can see, apart from some short segments, it looks pretty decent. And definitely something that a cartographer can pick up and, and finish within a relatively short amount of time. So the future plans that we have for this project is first of all, of course, we want to make sure that we keep improving the output quality, especially in those shorter segments. If we can sort of figure out how to do them in a more smart way, it could save a lot of time. And the other thing is for the bus stops. Um, as I mentioned, we, we just recently got access to a new data set, which 
would make it easier for us to generate a list of bus routes that stop at every stop. And we don't actually have to do the matching based on purely on geometry, which, as I mentioned, would be risky, especially when it comes to overpasses or tunnels or stuff like that. And as I said, it's an ongoing process. We're not done yet. Um, I, I'm fond of saying a map is never done. And I think the same thing goes for a process like this. We'll keep on finding ways to, uh, to improve on this. So in conclusion, um, FME can be a big time saver in the cartographic production process. It can introduce a lot more consistency. You're taking away a little bit of the human error factor. And this helps cartographers to focus on the bits of the process where their skills are really necessary. So they don't have to do all of the boring drudgery work, but they can focus on the fun challenges. So thank you very much. If you want to get in touch with me, there's my email address. If you want to connect on Twitter or Instagram, that's where you can find us. And we love to talk about maps and we love to see maps. Now, our next presenter, Patrick Koning, unfortunately couldn't make it live, but he has pre-recorded his presentation. So without further ado, I will get that started. And there should be sound. Hi there, nice of you all to join in to my presentation. I'll be talking about how I used FME in the building process of an application. This results in having FME facilitate in continuous improvement and development of the application. As the title states, using FME to facilitate continuous improvement of your application. My name is Patrick Koning. I'm a certified professional. I'm working with FME 40 years, but always trying to find new ways to get the best out of it. I used it in the Dutch railroad company, different utility companies, and also municipalities, and of course, the ones I forgot to mention. The big question with transforming data. I'm reading data from the file, transform it to a geo portal, this question arises. Is all the data there? But first, let's start at the beginning. What are the objectives? The desired functionality is that with the click import for ArcGIS, the user can import the cables and pipes from the click report to the ArcGIS platform. The result is a feature service that can be used from both ArcGIS desktop and portal and parse portal or online portal. For example, the data can also be used from apps that use the data from the portal or RGS online. Think of field maps. And of course, during the process, we ran into some challenges. Mapping all different features and attributes, we had 42 different features, 764 attributes to that features. Applying operation on the attributes, operations, for example, relations between features, or using only a specified part of an attribute. Improving developing speed, 
are looking for what is missing in the end result, lots of time passed. Find errors in the application. Debugging on data errors is very time consuming. The challenge, do I have all the data in my application? Very used FME. We used FME to report on the data transformation and what should be in the end result. Clients should be happy to see all the data reach the destination. The solution we built, mapping all features and attributes using XLS, test if we have the expected result, and report on missing features, and report on differences in attributes, and report on differences in geometry. Here you see the solution. Let's talk a little about the cadastro first. The Dutch government issued a law that all underground asset owners must deliver their data to cadaster in order to be able to locate potential problems when someone starts a dig. All digs are registered with cadaster, and after registration of your dig area, you get a notification which includes an XNF an XML file with all the registered assets. Then click import, takes the XML file and uploads it onto ArcGIS Online or Enterprise Portal as the desired as a desired feature surface. It's here. And after that, we made with FME reports on the data in the portal. And the reports to ensure we didn't miss anything. I'll get back on the reports later on. I have some tips. Integrate FME in your application building process. Develop your application and workspaces together. So you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to find out what you did in the application. Develop in small steps so it makes it easier to get to get these things done together. No shortcuts, no shortcuts. Shortcuts will cost you a lot in the end and during the lifespan of the application. Last but not least, work neatly and describe the decision making in the workspace. This is already mentioned by Lars de Vries on the presentation on the first day. And like I described in an article on my LinkedIn page. Here you see a report on the actual features, the feature counts exactly, or the missing features, differences. Yeah. Feature. Here we see a report on the actual differences in the features. The global ID is filled when a feature is found on the portal, else it exists only in XML, and then we have an XML local ID. So here we haven't implemented Tima yet correctly. So um, we detected uh, more Tima's in the XML than in the portal, but we didn't implement it correctly. So all the themas that were in were mentioned in the XML, but only in the application, there were only themas that are used. So therefore we had it in the report and we could uh, change our application. Also, opdrachtgever is mentioned here and we didn't find any opdrachtgever in the XML. And that is because we, it, it uh, was a dummy in the test case, uh, this report uh, turned on. But of course, it is very nice to know this is also working. Then we have a report on attribute differences. The local ID is the same for the XML and for the portal. And 
we have here uh, the attribute name, and then there's differences in the name. We use the attribute name or from the XML or from the GDB or portal. In this case, we had uh, differences in the, in the values for uh, the lifespan. And uh, this was a rounding error. And the XML uh, we rounded and used only the uh, year, month, and day. But in the application, we rounded uh, the whole number, which includes hours and minutes. So we could have a little difference here. But we fixed it in the application, where we only look at the uh, uh, years, months, and days now. In the geometry report, we'll be seeing missing geometries or geometries with differences. Here you see a geometry. In this case, geometry that was missing in the result due to the fact that there are possibly more geometries to one feature and we didn't anticipate it on it. So when it showed up in, in this report, we could change the application. So we know what was going wrong. And the end results. People trust the application to show them what is necessary. We now don't have to debug intensively on the data to find an issue because they are already in the report. We can now continuously develop and improve on the application while testing and reporting automatically. So the quality stays high. My future plans, I will use the mic this to migrate to a new source format. Cadastra is changing its format and we want to connect to it. So we have to use this so we can use this same process. And of course, I would like to try out if I can use this in other applications. And a nice question for you all. Are you seeing some uh, so, some places where you could use this? So if you do, you let me know. Perhaps I can help. And the conclusion, adopting FME in an early stage of development would cut the developing time and testing time considerably. And when you are interested, visit my LinkedIn page for an additional post on FME and data quality with the title, Getting Lost in Your Data. Thank you all for watching. And have some fun with the other attractions on the fair. So that was Patrick's presentation. So let's see if there's uh, any questions that came up. I see one from Marku, I hope I pronounced that correctly, about the, um, the source formats, the, the format of the source data. Um, so the files that we get right now, the, the new files that I mentioned, uh, they're actually in map info format, map info mid-MIF. Um, we assume that there's more data in different formats available to them, but that's the format that we've been given. Um, another question from Jonas, um, whether or not I use FME only for generating the parallel lines or also for the text in the background map. Um, no, it's, it's primarily for the parallel lines. Uh, we do take the data for the background map, which again is uh, map info files. They're from the here data set, the, the topographic base layer data. And we convert them to a file geodatabase because then we can ease more easily with my publisher get a smaller um, selection out of that. We can do um, a crop on a crop up on import, which is faster in a file geodatabase than in MIPNIF files. 
Uh, Mark wants to know the scale of the maps. And he's right, I haven't actually mentioned that. Um, the scale of the maps, it kind of differs from map to map. Um, we're roughly, roughly in the 25 to 50,000 scale range. Let's see if there's... <laughs> oh, where, uh, where are one of the cycling jerseys? Actually, the cycling jersey that I was wearing that photo. Um, so Veerle, our, our marketeer, she is also a professional cyclocross rider and uh, Retro Graphics is a sponsor of her team. And she's actually, um, so for last season, she actually sold copies of her team outfit. That was not the one that I was wearing in that photo. That was the season before. Um, I'll see if I can find out the URL and we'll post it on Twitter. Uh, I'm sure she'll love to, to sell some more copies of that. <laughs> And we get some praise on our outfits, and that, well, I gotta say, when we when we heard when we heard about this uh, this theme, we decided to go all in. And we've we've actually done things like uh, three weeks ago. I was on vacation, and I happened to be right next to uh, an amusement park, which was closed, of course, because of COVID. Nobody can actually go there. But I, I kind of sort of snuck onto the grounds and took a photo of their roller coaster. <laughs> only to find out that last week and this week, you can actually climb that roller coaster. It's like, this is a missed opportunity. I should go back, but oh well, we, we unfortunately don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question from Tim uh, about what if the line, the bus line has uh, temporary deviations due to roadworks. Um, depending on how long temporary is. Um, if it's just for a few days, I don't think they'll be redoing maps or they'll probably do like a, a little, um, just a small area map focusing on just the detour, right? Honestly, we don't really have to worry about that in our process. But again, if the data is being supplied in the same way, we can just rerun the process. Um, so I think that's all of the questions that I see. Um, if there's any more questions, please feel free to get in touch with me directly. I love to talk about maps. I love to talk about FME. I love to talk about cycling. I love to talk about photo photography. Uh, just love to talk basically. Um, and I think now it's time to head, hand it over back to Inge and to... Uh, Close off the day. All right. All right, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, well, we had fun doing this. Um, I hope you have too. Tomorrow we'll be back with part two and our marketeer and acrobat Vele will be joining us as well. So come back, we have fun and uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow and enjoy the rest of the World Fair. <laughs>